Brian Smith here, and welcome to the Dream Path Podcast, where I try to get inside the heads of talented creatives from all over the world. My goal is to demystify and humanize the creative process and make it accessible to everyone. Now let's jump in. Jason Moore, welcome back to the Duocast. Oh, I'm so glad to be back. It's been crazy. It's been crazy, and it's been quite some time since we've actually sat down together. And, and here, we're not even sitting down together. We are respecting the social distancing guidelines and being safe with the, the pandemic situation. Yep. I'm sitting in my studio. You're sitting in yours. Yeah. And I assume you're fully clothed, hopefully. I am today. Um, yeah. Unlike our face-to-face -face, uh, duo cast that, that where you're pretty much buck naked pretty much i like to keep my underwear on just because i don't <laughs> like i don't like sticking to the leather seats that you have <laughs> yeah. well jason it, it's uh it's really good to reconnect with you in this format after all of this time since we started the sundance episodes yes i it's it's good to sit down and actually finally get to talk to you about this it's been about what two months it's it's been a while i mean i i think it was really before I went to Park City. That I think that was the time frame that we sat down and did a duo cast, just like right before I went to Park City. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, how are you holding up over there with all of the um, isolation and social distancing and toilet paper <laughs> shortages and and the craziness that's happening right now? Um, we're actually holding up really good. The uh, social distancing thing doesn't really. It doesn't really affect me too bad. I, I spend a lot of time indoors anyway. I'm not a big social person, um, but, you know, it is kind of a pain in the neck to, you know, not really get to go out and do the things like go into restaurants and things like we used to do, go to the bars and stuff like we used to. And everybody now with the six foot rule is really, really kind of touchy on how close you can be to them, how close you can be to them when you talk to them and just the way they're acting. And I think that that's actually kind of good. People want to keep their distance. And I think that the sooner we keep our distance and stay inside and let this thing kind of take its course, I think the better we'll be because this needs to stop. We need to, we need to be able to get back to normal at some point. Yeah. I I'm with you on that, Jason. I, I, I think we need to do what's difficult now and uh, hunker down, as they say, and endure the the isolation and the the, the lack of um, social contact. And and also, you know, it is it is tough. It's really tough to you know respect those those six foot boundaries because it's awkward, and we don't want to be viewed by other people as alarmist or overreacting. And so, I think there's sort of a natural tendency to to try to downplay a little bit. But I think it's important that we all really just dive into the, what the medical advice is and the, the advice from scientists, which is keep your distance and ride this thing out and let's get back to normal. I agree. How's your uh, toilet paper supply doing? <laughs> we're, we're doing fine, but uh, it's, it's always a touch and go situation. You, you got to time your grocery store trips, uh, early morning uh, adventures uh, to the grocery store and, and really be strategic about you know, you're shopping so that you can get the supplies you need. But yeah, it's, it's a little distressing to, uh, to go from the, the opulence of the park city experience where sort of the world was my oyster. And, you know, it was, it was a lot of hard work, but at the same time, it felt like kind of living in the lap of luxury a little bit, like you're, you're rubbing elbows with the stars and you're going to these premieres and, Nobody is thinking about, even though it was happening at the time, nobody's really thinking about this global pandemic that's about to hit the United States and and change, really just completely change our culture and our economy for who knows how long. I mean, this could be a permanent change in the way that we go about traveling and the way that we go to restaurants and who knows what's going to unfold from this. But it's a really jarring bizarre couple of months i can tell you it's um i'm still trying to wrap my brain around it yeah me too um i was lucky enough that uh when it all started happening i went out and i feel like a soldier i went out there on a mission for days and found supplies and found stuff that i need i didn't hoard i don't have a garage full of toilet paper 
but I found what I needed and I still have some of it. And I feel like I did a pretty good job doing that without hogging it for everybody else. I think that that's a problem too, is that people tend to kind of panic and think, oh, we better get everything that we can and just pack our garage full. And who cares about everybody else? You know, that's kind of the attitude I think some right. people have, you know. Um, but right. No, we're doing good. We're doing really good. We're, I get to spend more time with, with my wife, which is great. We have a good old time. We, we just make each other laugh all day. So it's fun. So what are you doing to stay sane in the house? And, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, movies or music or television, what are you doing? Drinking. No, um, <laughs> actually, <laughs> actually, um, you know, I just, as you know, I've just been working and we've been hammering out these episodes. We had eight of them from Sundance and that actually has been keeping me pretty darn busy. Um, just trying to stay busy doing things around the house. Uh, like I said, spending time with the wife, listening to music, playing music, learning new songs, writing new songs. Um, uh, I got back into Frank Zappa. I haven't listened to a lot of Zappa in years, got into his whole catalog and was kind of, uh, uh, geeking out on some of his videos on YouTube, some of that stuff. He's a very underrated musician. I think a lot of people think that he was just weird. And I, I think of him as super intelligent, um, highly skilled, uh, just a, a musician, a musical brain. Frank Zappa was, um, I've, I've also been, um, watching a lot of videos on YouTube. Um, anyone that'll sort of present itself with unfinished studio work from different bands like the Beatles. I found a bunch of early demos from Van Halen that I'd never heard from the mid seventies. You know, I, I keep myself busy with and entertain myself largely just internet. As long as I have internet, I think I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. I think we, we've all got, we, we've all got plenty of um, content out there to, to consume for sure. And um, it sounds like though that you're, you're kind of, um, diving into some some esoteric areas like zappa mm -hmm. uh, i it's interesting I, I was just looking at a video the other day of a reconstruction of a of a guitar it's a gibson it looks like an sg guitar that dweezil zappa mm. had taken on an airplane and uh some airline had damaged the guitar so badly the entire neck just broke in half at the top oh man and um and so i watched this this video of the process of of fixing this guitar and and when you look at the broken guitar it almost makes you want to cry mm -hmm. and uh but it, it, it's interesting that you are you're you're diving into zappa frank zappa and then i i see this video on dweezil zappa who who really kind of takes after his dad i think there's a lot of oh yeah influence there and um there's a lot of DN, uh, shared DNA that you kind of hear in Dweezil's music, but I'm with you on the musical genius part uh, because Frank Zappa, it's not, it's definitely not easy listening. Uh, I, I would say no, it's, um, it's probably like, it's probably even more inaccessible and challenging than the most hardcore jazz that you'll ever listen to. Oh, for sure. Um, and that's why he's kind of a, He's kind of a musician's musician, and, and it's one of the reasons why I really haven't fully appreciated Frank or Dweezil Zappa, because it's it's so difficult and challenging material, you know, to to appreciate. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I've been, uh, I don't know, man, I've been busy with the podcast and work, and uh, I, I've watched some streaming shows on Netflix. I, I, I of course, watched Tiger King, uh, which was... Um, disturbing extremely disturbing <laughs> to say the least uh, i've read a few books uh, reading some malcolm malcolm gladwell books and you know read blink and now i'm into talking with strangers i think it's called and uh, i'm you know talking to strangers by malcolm gladwell but malcolm's one of those those authors that i can i can always i can reread his books too and get kind of more out of it the second time than i i did the first time I don't know. I think everybody's trying to find what their equilibrium is in this environment of very extreme limitations being put on our ability to travel and kind of do the things that we 
like to do on the weekends and after work. And right here, we can't even work really. I mean, unless you're an essential worker, you know, you're stuck at home. That's true. Um, but it's, uh, it's also interesting to, it's, it's interesting to see how we interact with our families when, <laughs> when we are hunkered down with them for such an extended period of time. You know, I think we, we get to know each other in a different way. And I think that's, that can be healthy. So I'm, I'm trying to lean into it and play cards more with my family, you know, board games. Right. Yeah. And just be with them. You know, just the act of just being with your family for, for that long. It's, uh, it's challenging because we're not, we're not used to it. And then we also have to be conscious of how much time we spend on social media which can be a rabbit hole that, oh, yeah. you know, uh, really pulls you away from, <laughs> from pulls you away from what's important and sends you into a tailspin of existential uh, dilemma. And so that, those are my rambling thoughts on on the last couple of months, man. It's been it's been quite a ride and and really bizarre. That's that's how I would describe it. Just bizarre and and and, and almost uh, surreal. I agree. That's exact. It's the exact way I feel about it too. And I, I feel like you, you got pretty lucky. Uh, the timing on, uh, the Sundance thing was, was great because had it happened even maybe even two weeks to three weeks earlier, you, the Sundance probably wouldn't have happened. Oh yeah. They would have shut down Sundance for sure. Yeah. You know, we, you did good. You came, came back with eight great interviews and, um, what, I, I got a question for you. What, what one was your favorite one? What, what interview did you, what resonated more with you out of all of the eight episodes? Which one was your favorite? That's a great question. I, I think that the Brian Knappenberger episode, which is, oh, episode 41, mm-hmm. um, that one resonated with me because of the, the work that I do and you know, the, I'm a trial lawyer by day, as you know, and I, a a big part of my practice is representing survivors of childhood sexual abuse against institutions like the Catholic church or the Mormon church or the boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened coincidentally that Brian Knappenberger, who's a documentary film director, uh, had a documentary called church in the fourth estate that was premiering at Sundance. And so I asked his publicist if he'd be interested in an interview and it all kind of lined up and I got to talk to him there with the subject of that film, Adam Steed, who is a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and was kind of a whistleblower against the boy scouts and the Mormon church and a really compelling story. I mean, I connected with all of the guests and I, I appreciate all of the, the interviews in their own, you know, unique ways and the way that they contributed to kind of this body of work that I brought back from park city, but because of the work that I do and that I've done for the last 20 years, the Brian Knappenberger episode really, uh, really hit me and, and resonated with me. And, um, and then you pointed out that, uh, during the interview, he disclosed that Brian did, uh, that he had a, a Netflix project, a Netflix documentary that was going to be coming out soon. And he couldn't say the name of it during our interview. And you looked it up and actually watched it. And it's the the trials of Gabriel Fernandez. Yeah. And so I, I watched that. I, I, it's still shaking me up. I'm thinking about that documentary because I have cases like that. And, um, it's so disturbing to to watch something unfold in a documentary format, multiple episodes, which is just kind of a, a fucking train wreck of a situation where a child is is abused and not only abused, but you know, social workers know about it and they don't do anything about it. And I won't spoil it for anybody if they want to watch it, but it is a, an extremely powerful, hard hitting documentary that uh, is now out on, on Netflix. It's, it's, it's gut wrenching. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, um, and I, I just can't shake it. I mean, I, I can't stop thinking about it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the one that was the most, most compelling for me. I, I think I enjoyed all of them. I really did. 
but uh, the couple, there's a couple that really resonated with me. Um, episode 35 with Jeff Orlowski, where he's talking about his films Chasing Ice and The Social Dilemma. I think that those were very interesting. Those are very interesting films. And I thought I really liked his work and how he, how they uh, did those films. Uh, another one that I liked was episode 37 with Nick Basta. Um, I, I've seen Nick in, in various shows. I've seen him on Law & Order SVU. Um, so I, I'm familiar with his face, and I was very interested in what he said that he wanted to do a documentary about Yogi Berra. And, you know, I've, I've been a baseball fan throughout throughout the years, and Yogi Berra is one of those figures in the 20th century that, I mean, if you don't know who Yogi Berra is, I don't know if you've been living under a rock or whatever, but I thought that he taking on that documentary, wanting to take on that project was, was really cool. And I hope he gets to do that. And of course I really liked Anthony Willis episode 38. I think it was, he is a film, does film scoring. Um, I don't know how they do it. I'd love to sit and watch somebody do it. It looks like a lot of work, but it looks fun. Yeah. Um, you've identified some, some interviews that were uh, memorable for me, for sure. And uh, it's hard to pick out one. I mean, I just, I, I bring up the Knappenberger interview because of the the connection that I have to the subject matter of his documentary that was at Sundance. But, you know, personally, I, I would say Nick Basta is the one that I feel like is, you know, someone I can <laughs> call a friend at this point. I mean, he's just, we, we connected instantly in the way that we met at the movie theater and the way that I found out, you know, that he was in one of the the films, which was the Glorias uh, with Julianne Moore yeah, at Sundance and, and then agreed to an interview when we were there, the, the way it kind of unfolded organically like that. And um, just what, it, how real and authentic he was and not pretentious in any way. I mean, just a true hardworking actor who, um, doesn't have any pretense about, you know, being in Hollywood or being in the movie business or film business. Um, really, I mean, none of my interviews had, had that type of pretense, but Nick really came across to me as someone that you know, I could have a beer with or, you know, hang out with and, Oh yeah, totally. And, um, and I just connected with him that way. And, and Audrey was another one of those, those interviews that just kind of had a, a, an immediate rapport with her. Mm -hmm. And, um, after the interview, I had a, a new respect for the behind the scenes folks who make these movies really happen, um, in term visually, you know, she's, um, production designer. She was on this film called the last shift with Richard Jenkins. And, uh, you know, the, the way that she described how it came together visually really opened my eyes to how much work goes into making a film before you even turn on the cameras and all of the planning and, and, uh, set construction and, uh, you know, the thought process that goes into that before you start recording, uh, is, uh, is pretty eye opening. And, um, you know, Florentine was another one that I, I really enjoyed Florentine to sit down with, um, someone who, you know, English is not her first language. And so we had someone helping with translation a little bit. And it was, uh, one of her production managers, Magali. And, and I learned about animation and that very specific type of animation that she does out of Paris Yeah, and how long it takes, you know, one minute per month to, to put that together. That was pretty cool. Crazy. Uh, Christian Zuniga, Christian Zuniga was, was another one that I, I kind of connected with almost like, like he's one of my peers, mm -hmm. you know, just somebody who uh, is, who, who doesn't have any pretense about being in the industry. You know, when I asked him about wanting to do, um, to be a producer or a director and he just immediately said, no, no, no. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I this is what I want to do. Cinematography. I don't want to have to deal with everything that directors and producers have to deal with. And he knows what his role is in the film industry and what he likes to do. Very decisive that way. Yeah, exactly. And, um, I, I, I think there's a, there's something admirable about folks who 
understand what their passion is within a certain industry. It's not like he's bouncing around like a pinball in a pinball machine, you know, looking for the next best thing. He knows exactly what his talent is and what his highest and best use is. And that's, he has an eye for, you know, seeing through the lens and capturing the director's vision through camera work. And that's what cinematography is. And so I learned a lot about cinematography, just talking to Christian Mm -hmm. and, um, and also how the industry works in terms of living in Atlanta versus Los Angeles. I don't know. There's just, it, it was looking back on the Sundance episodes for me, probably one of the most fulfilling journeys I have been on in, in this podcast uh, situation, going to Park City, being on location, being able to talk to people face to face about something that they're deeply passionate about, that they should be proud of because because they've been invited into this elite festival. Right. Uh, probably the most preeminent festival in the entire world when it comes to other than maybe can when it comes to recognition of, of uh, that type of work. That's a long rambling way of saying what a really fucking cool journey this has been. And uh, I appreciate you doing such great work, making them sound pristine uh, from an audio standpoint and cutting them to, you know, really portray the guests in, in the best light possible and make them sound great and make me sound great. And, um, I just appreciate you as my co-pilot, man. Thank you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that very much, Brian, but really what it comes down to is that sweet chocolatey voice of yours. (laughs) Yeah. Well, um, you should have been doing radio for you. You you should have been in radio from the get go. Yeah. Well, it it didn't even cross my mind, man. And until, I, uh, I burned out a little bit on the law and, and looked for, you know, something creative to do and then found, found podcasting of all things to, um, kind of take me in the, in that creative direction. But, uh, so, you know, the next thing we have to decide, Jason, is what are we going to do now that we don't have any more Sundance content? Uh, we, we went from two episodes per month. So one every two weeks to one episode per week after I came back from park city. And the reason we went, we, the reason we went to one episode per week was to make sure that the guests that I interviewed did not have to wait for months to hear their interview and share it with their, their colleagues and friends and family. And I think it worked out pretty well. Uh, it was nice to to have that content just oh yeah you know on a regular basis once a week every Wednesday, and here we are now facing a decision. We have we have you know we're at a crossroads, and the crossroads decision we have to make is what are we going to do with the frequency of our episodes? You know, one of the challenges we're going to face is that if I can't go get these interviews done in person for the foreseeable future. I'm going to have to do this remotely through the internet like you and I are doing right now. And I, I don't like doing that. I it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a tough decision for me because, uh, you know, part of me wants to dial it back and go back to once every two weeks, just so we can, you know, kind of ride out this storm And then once I'm able to travel and to do this face-to-face more often, maybe move to a once per week frequency. But what are your thoughts on that, Jason? Well, I, I've been thinking about that actually. And I think for now, while this uh, COVID-19 stuff's going on, definitely going to have to do it remotely, which I know is terrible. I know it's not ideal. It doesn't, it doesn't have the same sound quality and the same quality altogether as you would face to face, but it's, it's doable. People can still listen. I'm okay with doing a, a duo cast or a recap every other week, like we were doing before, just to kind of stretch it out a little bit. And maybe, maybe that's not the right term. I don't know, but just to kind of, like you said, write out the storm, because I think we're going to need to do that for at least, gosh, I think probably another month, if not two. Yeah, I think I think we're going to be looking at the summer before anybody is talking about traveling anywhere safely. 
but you know, think about it this way. Maybe, maybe I should be looking at it like, well, with internet interviews via Zoom or you know whatever the platform is on the internet to record these interviews. If I'm not traveling to these folks to interview them, maybe I can crank out even more interviews than I normally would. Yeah. And I can get those up. You know, what I would hate to do is have a guest that I would much prefer to talk to in person and then kind of waste that interview with a lesser quality audio experience by doing it over the internet. That's what my main concern is. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that. I don't know that we're, we'll make any final decisions, but we do have some pretty exciting guests coming up and you know, what, what is the next interview that we have um, that'll be launched after, well, uh, after this duo cast? Uh, next week is David Frangioni. He's a uh, drummer and producer, recording engineer. I think he works with Aerosmith. Yeah. Yeah. Well, D- David Frangioni was, uh, was a fun interview and I, I talked to him from his home in Florida and, uh, it's, uh, probably going to be the new norm that I'm just talking to folks over the internet via, you know, zoom or whatever the, the format is. But David has a really interesting, rich career to talk about in terms of his knowledge about audio recording and how he got involved with Aerosmith and recording those albums. And also his work uh, as the publisher of Modern Drummer Magazine, mm. uh, but his his his, uh, his resume is really fascinating. Such an eclectic guy. He's written books, two of which are on the subject of Clint Eastwood movies. He's a big Clint Eastwood fan. He donates all the proceeds from the sales of his books to charity, and uh, he's just a really interesting guy. So I hope folks are are able to listen to that episode and that this new approach to interviews via the internet will actually uh, work uh, in our favor to be able to put out more content out there because we don't have to take the time and resources uh, to actually travel to them during this pandemic situation. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to uh, see how this plays out. I, I honestly didn't think, you know, when all this started, I, I honestly didn't think that it would affect us at all. Uh, as time went by, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's going to. It's going to affect everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I think everybody's trying to get a sense of what it means to them and their their work life and their personal life and their future. I mean, it's, it's really hitting a lot of people pretty hard mm-hmm. and uh, changing our world around us, whether we like it or not. And so we just have to figure out what that means for each of us and then figure out a way to get through it together. Right on. Well said, Brian. Yeah. Well, uh, Jason, it's been really good to talk to you and get back into this duo cast groove again. And uh, let's let's do this more often. I'm with you on that. Um, but I am also looking forward to seeing you face to face at some point again. And, and we can sit in our underwear and do them from your house. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Looking forward to it, Jason. Just so people know, we're not really in our underwear when we when we do these interviews. Brian's really shy. Well, <laughs> yeah, you're not. <laughs> All right, Jason, signing off. All right, thank you, Brian. Hey, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Dream Path Podcast. If so, I have a favor to ask. Can you go to your favorite podcast service and give me a rating and review? Your feedback is what keeps this podcast going. I appreciate your time, and as always, go find your dream path.